During the fourth quarter of 1965, this nation continued significant strides in developing an operational manned spaceflight capability. Major events included preparations for the first Apollo operated Saturn I mission, an unmanned flight in which the spacecraft will carry major new systems and the launch vehicle will carry a new second stage and instrument unit. And the events included rendezvous between the Gemini 7 and Gemini 6 spacecraft. At NASA's White Sands Test Facility, New Mexico, the first firing program for the Apollo spacecraft propulsion subsystem was completed, qualifying the subsystem for the first Apollo operated Saturn I flight. The nozzle skirt shown here is a ground test model and is replaced by a flight type nozzle skirt for missions. The design of structural reinforcing for the Apollo command module aft heat shield was qualified in water drop tests conducted by North American. The test removed a major constraint on the first Apollo operated Saturn I launch. Another Apollo milestone was achieved with the delivery of the first engineering models of the lunar mission pressure garment and backpack. Systems integration will be completed by the manned spacecraft center. As spacecraft hardware continued to meet development schedules, launch vehicle development reflected similar progress. At the Marshall Space Flight Center, automatic checkout equipment was used for the first time in continued developmental firings of the Saturn V first stage all systems test vehicle. The tests continued full duration firing programs in which the stage achieved its full thrust of seven and a half million pounds. Full scale Saturn V dynamics testing came a step closer to reality with the delivery to Marshall of the first stage dynamics test vehicle. The stage, the first built by Boeing at NASA's Mashu assembly facility, will receive minor modifications before being installed in the Saturn V dynamics test stand. Second stage dynamics testing was temporarily delayed at Seal Beach, California, where North American had begun load tests of the Saturn V second stage structural dynamics test article. The stage met and exceeded the most severe loading conditions anticipated for Apollo. However, on September 28th, the stage ruptured with tank pressures at the peak of design limits. Enough data were obtained before the failure to successfully complete the structural test program. The second stage all systems test vehicle will be instrumented to substitute as a dynamics testing vehicle. The stage was installed at NASA's Mississippi test facility during the quarter. Following completion of hot firing tests, the stage will be shipped to Marshall for use in Saturn V dynamics testing. Initial Saturn V dynamics testing was completed at Marshall using a third stage test vehicle, an instrument unit, and a ground test spacecraft. Paralleling ground development work, Apollo Saturn flight hardware showed continued progress through manufacturing and checkout. At North American, the propulsion module for the second unmanned Apollo uprated Saturn I flight completed proof and leak testing. The command module for the second manned Apollo operated Saturn I mission was in wire harness installation in preparation for systems installation. At Grumman's Bethpage Long Island facility, the first flight configured ground test lunar module completed structural assembly and was moved into the final assembly area. The first flight article lunar module scheduled for an unmanned Apollo uprated Saturn I launch was in structural assembly. For the uprated Saturn I launch vehicle, Chrysler successfully completed acceptance firing tests of the third uprated Saturn I first stage at Marshall Space Flight Center. The second uprated Saturn I first stage had completed post firing modifications and checkout and will be shipped to the Kennedy Space Center early in the first quarter of 1966.
At Sacramento, California, Douglas completed acceptance firing of the second uprated Saturn I second stage. Douglas also prepared for acceptance firing of the third uprated Saturn I second stage. The stage will be used for a liquid hydrogen experiment that will provide data on the propellant's behavior during weightlessness. The test will help qualify the Saturn V third stage for the lunar missions. Manufacturing was well underway in all areas of the Apollo Saturn V program. At North American, heat shield fit checks were conducted on the command module for the first Apollo Saturn V mission. At Boeing Mishu, the Saturn V facilities vehicle completed post-manufacturing work in the new test and checkout building. The stage was the first to be completely checked out in the new facility, which was activated on schedule despite damage from Hurricane Betsy. At Marshall, pre-static checkout tests began on the first Saturn V flight first stage. The checkout marked the first use of Saturn V automated checkout equipment. At North American and Douglas, manufacturing continued on Saturn V second and third stages. Construction of ground test and launch facilities for Apollo Saturn V continued to keep pace with the development and manufacture of flight hardware. At NASA's Mississippi Test Facility, basic concrete work was completed on the second of two Saturn V second stage test stands. Construction on the first second stage stand was essentially complete. NASA gained beneficial occupancy on October 1st in time to receive the second stage all systems test vehicle. Concrete and steel work was 52% complete on the first side of the dual position first stage stand. Supporting framework for the flame deflector was essentially complete. At the Kennedy Space Center, exterior construction of pad A at Launch Complex 39 was complete. Beneath the pad, finishing work neared completion on the numerous service facilities that will support the first Apollo Saturn V missions. Steel work was completed on the nearby Apollo Saturn V mobile service structure. Outfitting of the 405-foot high structure will continue through the first quarter of 1966. In the vehicle assembly building, checkout platforms were completed in the 21-story low bay area for the assembly and checkout of the second and third stages of the Saturn V launch vehicles. In the adjoining 52-story high bay area, Work platforms were installed in two of the four checkout areas. The platforms will permit servicing at various levels of completely assembled Saturn V vehicles. Activities pointing toward more immediate manned spaceflight goals were apparent at Launch Complex 34, where preparations were underway for the first Apollo uprated Saturn I launch. Launch Complex modifications, which were completed during the quarter, included the installation of automatic ground support equipment. The first Apollo uprated Saturn I will be the first Saturn configuration to be tested, checked out, and launched by automatic equipment. Systems tests for the first uprated Saturn I vehicle were interrupted when overpressurization of a tank instrumentation section collapsed the top of one of the first stage fuel tanks. To de-erect the stage, remove the tank, and repair it at the Mishu assembly facility would have meant a three-month delay. Chrysler and NASA engineers, relying on experience gained in the Saturn I launch vehicle program, elected to replace the tank while the stage was erected. The tank exchange was completed within 24 hours. Immediately following tank change-out, the uprated Saturn I second stage was erected. Spacecraft modules for the first Apollo uprated Saturn I flight arrived at the Kennedy Space Center in October. The propulsion module was transported to the propulsion test facility at Complex 16, where pre-flight checkout programs were conducted, including a propulsion subsystem firing. While the propulsion module was undergoing static tests, the command module underwent electrical power and instrumentation checks at hypergolic test facility number one. 
The mated command and propulsion modules were later used in fit checks in one of the two 54-foot high altitude chambers completed in the manned spacecraft operations building. On December 26th, the spacecraft and the attached lunar module adapter section were mated to the uprated Saturn I. Systems tests began immediately in preparation for a launch early in 1966. In the Gemini program, flight progress hinged on the performance of the first Gemini Agena target vehicle. Thorough ground testing and a record of almost 90% success in nearly 200 launches of the parent Air Force Agena vehicle led to verification of the target vehicle without a flight test. The Atlas Agena target vehicle was launched from Cape Kennedy on October 25th. Although the Atlas performed perfectly, the Agena malfunctioned and failed to achieve orbit. It is believed that a hard start or backfire induced by a modified engine start sequence led to rupturing of the hypergolic propellant tanks. This would have caused the vehicle to explode. Top priority has been given to modifying the remaining five target vehicles to ensure their performance on the final Gemini missions. Loss of the target vehicle canceled the Gemini 6 mission. Astronauts Walter Schirra and Thomas Stafford were to have rendezvoused and docked their spacecraft with the target vehicle. To offset a threatened program delay, NASA began a series of rapid schedule and mission revisions. Gemini 6 was de-erected and Gemini 7 was erected in its place. Frank Borman and James Lovell, wearing new lightweight pressure suits, were the flight crew for Gemini 7. On December 4th, six weeks after the target vehicle failure, Gemini 7 rose from the Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 19. Primary mission of the flight, to evaluate the capabilities of the flight crew and spacecraft during 14 days of weightless flight. The spacecraft would also serve as a target vehicle for Gemini 6. Within 24 hours after Gemini 7 was launched, Gemini 6 was erected at Launch Complex 19. Eight days after Gemini 7 left the pad, Gemini 6 was ready for launch, completing a record pad turnaround one day ahead of schedule. On December 12th, the countdown for Gemini 6 reached zero. The engines ignited, then shut down. A pull-away checkout plug had prematurely dropped from the vehicle, causing engine shutdown. Three days later, astronaut Shira and Stafford again entered the Gemini 6 spacecraft. On December 15th, the third launch attempt for Gemini 6 was successful. The mission to rendezvous with Gemini 7. Guidance to the vicinity of the target vehicle would be by ground-based computer data gathered from worldwide tracking reports. Following several orbital altitude changes and one plane change, Gemini 6 was approximately 250 nautical miles behind Gemini 7. Command pilot Shira then switched to onboard radar. He then put Gemini 6 into a nearly circular orbit of 146 nautical miles, approximately 12 miles below Gemini 7. Terminal maneuvering using onboard computer guidance began about 15 nautical miles below and 30 nautical miles behind Gemini 7. Two additional mid-course corrections were made, followed by a braking maneuver to match Gemini 7's velocity. Rendezvous was accomplished approximately six hours after the launch of Gemini 6. During subsequent inspection and station keeping exercises, the spacecraft were flown to within one foot of each other. Had there been a docking ring on either spacecraft, a physical link-up would have been possible. All experiments were performed satisfactorily, including the first use of star sightings to align a spacecraft. The experiment proved the value of celestial navigation as a backup to a spacecraft's inertial guidance system. 
The flight was also the first in which the flight crew flew much of the mission in a shirt sleeves environment. For the Mission Control Center, Houston, the flight proved capability to direct and bring together two spacecraft at a predetermined point in space, a capability that will be essential to the Apollo lunar landing. Gemini 6 re-entered December 16th. Gemini 7 followed on December 18th. The spacecraft were the first to come in under controlled re-entry. Both landed within less than 10 miles of their predicted impact points. The accuracy of the landings demonstrated the feasibility of controlled re-entry for Apollo. Both spacecraft were recovered by the carrier WASP. All objectives of the Gemini 7 and 6 missions were accomplished. For example, the Gemini 7 crew completed the longest manned space flight to date, giving the United States an additional 330 hours of manned space flight experience. Of medical importance was the fact that the flight crew remained alert and performed efficiently throughout the 14-day mission. More significantly, post-flight medical examinations demonstrated that the astronauts had no inhibitive physiological effects. Overall, the Gemini 7 and 6 missions demonstrated a growing precision and flexibility in manned spaceflight operations. By the end of December, the last Gemini spacecraft entered final assembly and checkout, and preparations were underway for increasing operational proficiency during the remaining Gemini missions. The achievements in the fourth quarter of 1965 underscored the role of government industry cooperation in keeping manned spaceflight programs on schedule. These efforts forecast a sustained record of accomplishment as the United States continues to develop an operational manned spaceflight capability.